Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Ridwan Yahya. I work with Nigeria Center for Disease Control and also function as the coordinator for antimicrobial stewardship. Um, today we're going to be talking about antimicrobial stewardship and in doing that we'll just give an overview of what it is and with the following objectives. At the end of this module, uh, the trainees are supposed to understand what antimicrobial stewardship is and how it is linked to the National Action Plan for Antimicrobial Resistance. And of course, by the end of the module, we should be able to um, understand the requirement for a facility to implement antimicrobial stewardship, which are the six core elements. Um, it is important as healthcare workers to understand the burden of antimicrobial resistance. As a healthcare provider, just imagine a caring mother comes to your facility with a sick child with high grade fever with the hope that the child gets better. But because of the increasing rate of antimicrobial resistance, a lot of antibiotics that you must, must have used on that child couldn't work and the hope of that mother is dashed. So, it is important to understand the burden of antimicrobial resistance, one, and the drivers of this resistance. According to a publication on the WHO website around 2015, it is estimated that 50% of antibiotics are prescribed inappropriately. And of course, because we are looking at approaching antimicrobial resistance in both animal and human health sector, about 50% of these antibiotics in some of the countries that were surveyed are used for animal growth promotion. The One Health National AMR Action Plan, it's a national document that is aimed at addressing the burden and problems of antimicrobial resistance in both animal, human, and environmental sector. But for the purpose of this module, which is antimicrobial stewardship, we are focusing on focus area four of the National Action Plan, which is to promote rational access to antibiotics and antimicrobial stewardship through improving access to quality antimicrobial agent, promoting antimicrobial stewardship in humans and animals, and strengthen regulatory agencies across all sectors. What is antimicrobial stewardship? Antimicrobial stewardship is a set of coordinated strategies to improve the use of antimicrobial medications with the goal of enhancing patient outcomes. What are the aims for implementing antimicrobial stewardship in the facilities? As I said earlier, it is to improve the appropriateness of antimicrobial usage, improve and promote microbiologic lab utilization in the hospitals, and of course improve patient outcome and reduce adverse effect of these drugs. So the aim of this antimicrobial stewardship program in the facility is to improve appropriateness of antimicrobial usage, improve the utilization of microbiology laboratory, and of course improve patient outcomes and reduce adverse effect effect. So before we implement antimicrobial stewardship in our facility, it is very important that we identify problems associated with antimicrobial resistance. And these problems could be attributed to a lot of things, a lot of factors including inappropriate use of antibiotics, increasing antimicrobial resistance pattern in our facility and the, the state or even the country poor diagnostic capacity of our facilities, poor education of antimicrobial resistance itself and antimicrobial prescribing, rising cost pressure on hospitals of antibiotic usage. And of course, this is a very important global problem, which is there are few arsenal or reduced arsenal of antibiotics for effective treatment, treatment of infections. So where do we actually implement antimicrobial stewardship? 
Is it only in the facilities, healthcare facilities, or are there other places where we, we implement antimicrobial stewardship? Yes. Apart from the hospitals where you implement in all the departments and the hospitals, we also look at what is happening at the community. A greater percentage of antibiotics are being misused in our communities. You know, when you talk about the patent medicine vendors, the people go to the pharmacy, just walk into the pharmacy and, and purchase antibiotics without prescription. That in the community happens rampantly and something needs to be done through a coordinated action to ensure that antibiotics in the community are utilized appropriately. Coming down to the community again, we have private poultry farms, we have private animal farms. You know, farmers do not have, most of the farmers do not have the skills and knowledge on the burden of antimicrobial resistance or what the problems of using or overusing antibiotics on animals without veterinary prescriptions. Some of these antibiotics are used on these animals as growth promoters. Having said that, there are special considerations on how we implement antimicrobial stewardship program. These special considerations in the hospitals are mostly in the pediatrics. This is as a result of limited literatures on pediatric antimicrobial stewardship, difficulty in quantifying consumption of antimicrobials in pediatrics, and of course, because of the limited literatures, defining AMS outcomes in pediatrics is extremely difficult. So other factors that influence antibiotic use in pediatrics could be classified into the parent factors and of course the clinicians. So from the parent, you know, poor parents' health-seeking behavior can contribute to or can influence the use of these antibiotics on children. For example, a child wakes up in the morning with a fever, the mother just works to the pharmacy or she has an antibiotic in her cupboard. She just brings it out without going to the hospital and then commence treatment. That in itself is a bad antibiotic usage by parent and of course as a result of a poor health-seeking behavior of that parent. And of course one of the influencing factors is a perceived potential health threat. The parent might have the good health-seeking behavior for the child, but because of the perceived potential health threat of that child at that moment, the, patient, the, the parent is being tempted to use antibiotic on that child before taking that child to the hospital. And of course, one of the most important influencing factor is the cost of healthcare of an, and antibiotics. Access to healthcare is very, very important to determine how parents, how individuals utilize the healthcare services. So if the cost of the healthcare services is extremely high, the parent cannot afford to take their children to the hospital, then they result in using antibiotics and other medications without prescription. Coming to the clinician as factors that influence the use of antibiotics in children irrationally, of course, Clinicians have this perception also that the children are highly vulnerable to infectious diseases. Of course, again, uncertainty in diagnosis and prognosis of certain infectious diseases. Uncertainty in diagnosis may, might include poor capacity of the lab in those facilities to conduct tests that is reliable, that can be used to treat a child. And of course, fear of litigation can also influence the use of antibiotics. For example, when a child comes to the hospital seriously sick, in acute illness with high-grade fever, in our environment, litigation issues are coming up in the hospitals. The clinicians might have this fear that something might happen. What if something happened? Then he goes on to prescribe 
or commence antibiotics on the child without testing. So these are some of the influencing factors for the use of antibiotics in children. And they are, of course, a threat and they need to be looked at. Antibiotic prescription has to be guided by the use of laboratory. So while using these antibiotics in the hospital, what are the focus areas that we need to put into consideration in using antibiotics? One of those focus areas is indication. Is there any indication for the use of antibiotics? Indication means, was there any test conducted? If yes, when the results came out, did the physician streamline according to the results of the test from the lab? And selection, yes, you have sent a sample to the lab, result came out, and you have an array of antibiotics that are sensitive to that organism. How do you now select those antibiotics before you prescribe? It is important we put at the back of our mind that we need an antibiotic guideline to guide our selection of antibiotics. Dosage of antibiotic is very important and we have to put that in, into consideration, especially in pediatrics where you need the weight and age of the child to prescribe antibiotics. So dosage optimization is very important and critical in ensuring appropriate usage of antibiotics. And then duration of the treatment. If you're prescribing an antibiotic, it's important you specify the appropriate duration for that medications. And before it is being administered, you have to specify which route of administration you want to use for a particular antibiotics. It's very important. Having said that, education and training, monitoring and surveillance, and then reporting and feedback. So we are going to take one after the other to describe what this means in brief. Leadership and commitment. It is important that the hospital management gives antimicrobial stewardship a priority with an annual plan, appoint a leader of the committee to drive the activities of the antimicrobial stewardship in that facility, allocate human and financial resources. A budget line is very important for the sustainability of the program in the hospital, and that has to be provided by the leadership of that particular hospital. And that will serve also as a commitment by the leadership of that hospital. And of course, you don't just allocate human and financial resources without regular monitoring and measuring of implementation in the facility. So as it is a responsibility of the committee to do that monitoring, regular monitoring and evaluation of the implementation of AMS in the facility, it is also the responsibility of the leadership of the hospital to ensure that uh, the committee is doing its work as planned. Having the commitment, the leadership commitment, you know, having those um, accountability and responsibility, and those responsible are supposed to constitute the antimicrobial stewardship committee. And this include one, a clinical microbiologist who is supposed to be the leader of that committee, an infectious disease physician. You need a pharmacist who specializes in antimicrobial stewardship, an infectious, an infection control nurse, a hospital epidemiologist where they exist, and of course, very important information system specialists. And for you to be able to get this, there must be a facility-based program that is being planned for the committee to take action. How does this committee now communicate with the hospital community? Do they work in isolation? Are they just soldiers or policing what is happening in the facility? Is it just a standalone that is independent of other committee, committees in the hospital? No. The Antimicrobial Stewardship Committee doesn't work in isolation. It requires the cooperation and contribution from other committees that exist in the facility. 
And of course, it requires and has responsibility of the hospital management, where we have the medical director or chief medical director in some instances in the tertiary hospitals, where all the chief executive, as they call it, in the private institutions, you need an infection control manager. So the antimicrobial stewardship needs to collaborate with all these people in the hospital to successfully implement antimicrobial stewardship without problem. Now, having been having collaborating with all these committees and people in the hospital, you need to identify those AMS actions that need to be implemented in the hospital. So, but before you start, you need a guiding document. Like, for example, developing a policy and standard treatment guidelines, conducting regular ward rounds to see gaps, problems on the usage of antibiotics in the hospital and other interventions. In this regard, you can just select a department or unit where you can pilot and see what is happening at a particular point in time. Developing a list of approved antibiotics, that is called a formulary, drug formulary or antibiotic formulary in the hospital. You can get this using the national drug formulary adopt it and generate a hospital specific formulary that can be used to guide the use of antibiotics in the hospital. And of course, it's important that you as a team or committee get approval from the hospital management to have a list of restricted antibiotics. This is one of the important actions that needs to be taken to restrict overuse or inappropriate use of certain group of antibiotics. So how do you now get these actions? There are strategies for the AMS committee or AMS team to select their AMS actions. And these strategies are called the core strategies and supplementary strategies. And we have three core strategies. This include multidisciplinary team, which has already been formed, prospective audit and feedback, formulary restriction and pre-authorization. Now, what's, what is prospective audit and feedback? Prospective audit means going back to look at prescriptions made by clinicians. Was there indication if yes? How was the antibiotic selected? Was there dose optimization? What was the route of administration? For how long was the drug administered? These are very important parameters that can be used to assess rationality or appropriateness of antibiotic usage. Where you find a fault, where you find a gap, it is important you intervene and provide a feedback to the clinician so that things can be done correctly in the subsequent patient. Formulary restriction and pre-authorization. This is where certain group of antibiotics are identified in the hospital and then restricted where a prescriber prescribes, it is not dispensed until it is approved by an assigned individual. It could be the clinical microbiologist, it could be the infectious disease physician or a pharmacist that will approve that particular antibiotic before it has been dispensed. Some of the supplementary strategies include streamlining our treatment, where you must have started empirical treatment and awaiting culture results to be out. As soon as the culture result is out, it is expected of the clinician or the managing physician to streamline to the results from the lab. Intravenous to oral conversion, this is a routine work, but it is important for it to be institutionalized through documentation, through policy, that after a certain period of time, 24 to 48 hours, 48 to 72 hours, intravenous medications need to be reviewed. If the patient can tolerate orally, it's important that we convert from intravenous to oral. And of course, how do you change behavior? It is very important as a supplementary strategy to improve the education of the healthcare facilities on antimicrobial stewardship, on the rational use of antibiotics. Uh, of course, for them to change their behaviors in prescribing antibiotics. 
The next core element is education and training. This we have said earlier, but in this regard, there are specific areas that need to, to be given emphasis. Staff induction training. Before you employ healthcare workers in the facility, we can put it as a strategy that we need to give them some level of education on antibiotic optimization, you know, dispensing and administration. And of course, there is need after employment, there is need for a continued in-service training, you know, on antimicrobial stewardship, infection prevention and control for the staff. This will further strengthen the capacity of the staff to maintain infection prevention and control measures. And of course, in the long run, there may be not, no need for them to use antibiotics because they have prevented infection. Monitoring and evaluation as a core element for antimicrobial stewardship in the facility is very important. As you are implementing your activities, it's important you monitor and you collect data. Data is very important. All that you have done, if you don't document data, is as good as you've not done that particular action. So what do you audit? What do you monitor? As we mentioned earlier, prescription audit, where you look at prescriptions to see whether there are indications of dose optimization and all that. You ne also need to collect data on antimicrobial usage in the hospital. This you can do through the antibiotic use point prevalence survey. At this point, you look at a particular point in time, you look at what is happening in the ward. Get a, go to a ward, get patient sampled, sample the number of patient, and then look at the folders at that particular point in time to see what is actually happening. That is what we call antibi antibiotic use point prevalence survey. Of course, you want to know how much antibiotics or antimicrobials the hospital is consuming. In this, you are not interested in what the patient, a specific patient is taking. Antimicrobial consumption is an aggregate, aggregate data of how much antibiotics or antimicrobials are consumed in the hospital. This can be um, gotten through calculating the defined daily doses, you know, days of therapy and all that. All these will be thought in one of the models in the course of the training. And of course, antimicrobial resistance is a very important component of monitoring and evaluation and surveillance as a co-element you know, of antimicrobial stewardship. Here you um, collect antimicrobial resistance data from the lab, utilize it to develop an antibiogram. An antibiogram is a document that is generated from arrays of antibiotics with against certain organisms that are sensitive to those antibiotics over a period of time. So that is very important in the hospitals if the lab can generate and of course share with the clinicians so they can see the sensitivity pattern of organisms in that hospital and can be used for empirical treatment. Of course, reporting and feedback. You have done monitoring, you have evaluated, you have done surveillance, you've collected a lot of data. What do you do with the data? The essence of collecting data is for public health intervention. But if you don't report, if you don't give a feedback, there won't be any intervention that can be made. Therefore, after collecting data from surveillance, you analyze the data and document. You document and transmit this data to the necessary authority, to the appropriate authority, which include the hospital management, the committee, the AMS committee, who also has responsibility to transmit this data to the state or national antimicrobial stewardship pillar of the AMR technical working group. It is very important. This data will be validated and of course sent to global antimicrobial surveillance system and of course, it is important at this point for the trainees to know that currently Nigeria has been sending AMR data to the Global Antimicrobial Surveillance System, the GLASS. 
that brings us to the end of this module. But in conclusion, we were able to link the antimicrobial stewardship program in the facility with the national program under the National Action Plan for Antimicrobial Resistance, which is to promote rational access to antibiotics and antimicrobial stewardship. And in the, in the module, we were able to define antimicrobial stewardship in simple terms, which means a coordinated actions to ensure rational use of antibiotics for the betterment of the patient. We've also looked at in details the requirement for implementing antimicrobial stewardship in the facilities, which are the six AMS core elements, which include leadership and commitment, accountability and responsibility, antimicrobial stewardship actions, education and training, monitoring, monitoring and surveillance, and of course, a very important reporting and feedback. My viewers, is important as healthcare workers to be seen using antibiotics rationally while we continue to advocate responsible use within our facilities and the community for the overall good of our patient. Thank you for listening and I hope you get more details on the scripted version of this module. Thank you.